What's a vegetable? You might come up with potato, broccoli, carrot, etc. Now quickly, what's a vegetable oil? You might say soybean oil, corn seed oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, etc. But all of these oils that you mentioned come from pressing the seeds of the plants. So shouldn't we call them seed oils instead of vegetable oils? Today these so-called vegetable oils are used in almost every household for two simple reasons. First, they are easy on the pocket. And second, they have no smell. So you have a better control on the flavor of the dish that you're cooking. But wait a second. I come from a mustard growing farmer family. And I grew up in a household where we use cold pressed mustard oil, which has a very unique and distinct smell. But strangely, when you buy the beautifully packaged refined oil from the supermarket, it has no smell of any kind. How? I wanted to know the answers. So I started researching, and what I found blew my mind. Our story starts in 1837. P and G used to make soaps and candles back then. They depended on animal fats to produce their soaps and candles. But the Panic of 1837 forced them to look for a cheaper replacement of expensive animal fat. And so PNG decided to use a virtually worthless byproduct of cotton production, cottonseed. Cottonseed could be crushed to get oil from it, but the process was not very efficient. The seed is very small, and it has very small amount of oil in it, but nonetheless, because of the excessive oversupply of cotton seeds, it was still worth it for P&G to use cotton seed oil to make their soaps and candles. This clever idea made P&G rich. Everything was going great, but then in 1882, Edison started the Edison Electric Illuminating Company betting on direct current. Then in 1886, Westinghouse Electric Company started supplying alternating current to American households. The writing was on the wall for P&G. Electrification would mean the demand for their candles would be wiped out in the near future. So, P&G executives started looking at other uses of cottonseed oil. And in 1901, they found that cottonseed oil can be potentially sold as a cooking fat. Until then, people used natural fats like tallow, butter, lard, and coconut oil as a cooking fat. So, P&G had identified a great potential market for the cottonseed oil. But then some uncomfortable facts emerged. Cottonseed oil has two very toxic components, gossypol and CPFA or cyclopropene fatty acid. Gossypol causes infertility, liver damage, hypokalemia, paralysis, and digestive problems. CPFAs are cancer causing. In fact, when USDA officials experimented with cottonseed as a potential feed for livestock and horses and rabbits, they found that those rabbits and horses would suffer from digestive disorders and would eventually die. This cottonseed thing was indeed toxic. Apart from toxicity, there was another big elephant in the room. Cottonseed oil was a liquid at room temperature. Traditional cooking fats were all solid at room temperature. Many consumers considered liquid oils to be inferior to solid oils. A liquid cottonseed oil will not replace the traditional cooking fats. If P&G could find a way to somehow change the liquid cottonseed oil to a solid form, then they could use some good marketing to convince consumers to ditch the centuries-old traditional cooking fats. P&G could be a very, very, very rich company if they could pull it off. Luck was in favor of P&G. In 1903, Wilhelm Norman patented the liquid form of hydrogenation. In simple words, he found the magic wand that can change an unstable liquid fat into solid fat. Just add some hydrogen to the liquid fat and voila, it will turn into a solid fat at room temperature. It would look and feel like a traditional cooking fat. Yay! But what about the toxicity? It wouldn't look good if their PNG branded cooking fat made the consumers infertile, sick and cancer ridden. They found a way around that too. All you have to do is bleach and deodorize the cottonseed oil. And voila, the oil has no odor and no flavor. Problem solved. But then, what name should be given to this new product? The bleached, deodorized and hydrogenated cottonseed oil was an industrialized thing which was not found in the kitchen, or for that matter, anywhere else in the natural world. In fact, before this, 
industrialized food making was just doing the same things that you would do in your home but at a much larger scale. For example, you could churn butter from milk at your home. So industrialized butter making was just using the same process, churning with a much larger churn in a much larger amount of milk or yogurt. But with this bleached, deodorized and hydrogenated cottonseed oil, that was not the case. This was something that could never be made in a home. This was probably the first ultra-processed food, but perhaps naming this thing ultra-processed cottonseed oil would not sound good to the ears of the paying customers. PNG used the name shortening. Traditionally, shortening was any cooking fat that was mixed with flour to create flakiness in a dish. Adding cooking fats to the flour shortens the gluten fibers in the dough, making it less starchy and more flaky. And so the name shortening comes from this shortening of the gluten fibers in the dough. To sway consumers away from the horse killing and rabbit killing image connected with cottonseed oil, in 1911, PNG launched Crisco shortening, basically which stands for crystallized cottonseed oil. But how would you now convince the public to buy your orderless Frankenstein liquid solid thingy? Simple. Do some big time marketing. How? First, never ever say the word cottonseed oil when marketing it. Just call it Crisco. Second, project this factory-made hyper-processed Crisco as hygienic, wholesome and pure. Third, give out free Crisco samples and free Crisco cookbooks in which every recipe calls for Crisco. PNG widely advertised Crisco as having no taste, no odor, and it never gets rancid. Remember that scene in the famous documentary Super Size Me, where the Frankenstein McDonald's french fries in a jar didn't go bad even after 70 days? So if someone says their product never gets rancid, we know that it's not natural. But back in the day, Crisco used it as their marketing. To replace your kitchen's natural cooking fats, such as lard and butter with Crisco, a marketing budget of about $12 million today was set aside in 1911. And from 1912 to 1915, a further $108 million in today's money was spent on the marketing of Crisco. The result? PNG was able to convince the general public that this highly processed factory-made Crisco thing was a natural food just like lard and butter. It succeeded mainly because it looked like butter and lard. This marketing campaign was probably the first successful example of the American style of marketing where consumers were encouraged to put their trust in a brand name and not in the actual quality of the product itself. In this style of marketing, consumers' ignorance is corporate's bliss. By 1916, P&G was selling $800 million worth of Crisco in today's money every year. By 1922, Crisco had become so big in a retail price list from the government printing office that I discovered while researching for this video, Crisco was the only branded item in the whole list. Just like Xerox and Velcro and Hula Hoop, Crisco had achieved the holy grail of branding. Cottonseed were a waste in the 1830s, industrial lubricant in the 1870s, a soap in 1890s, and food in the 1910s. By the 1930s, cottonseed oil became so big that a single cottonseed mill was good enough to keep a whole town financially afloat in the south. The tiny cottonseed was getting mightier by the day. But then in 1933, the Agricultural Adjustment Act called for a considerable reduction in cotton acreage. Also, the US production of soy was getting bigger and bigger by the day. So PNG decided to replace the cottonseed oil with soybean oil. It was way cheaper, the sales continued to grow. Then in 1949, a small, cloudless non-profit called AHA American Heart Association suddenly got funding of a whopping $1.7 million from PNG, which in today's money is about $22 million. But why would PNG fund AHA? That too, with so much money. To be honest, I don't know. 
But I have two good guesses. First, maybe PNG executives knew deep down that this Crisco thingy that they were shoving down the throats of Americans was not good for health. And so, to keep selling Crisco, they wanted it to be endorsed as a heart-healthy oil by AHA. This was a strategy similar to the tobacco industry's massive advertisements where doctors were apparently recommending cigarettes as healthy to the general public. So that's my first guess. My second guess is that perhaps Crisco executives didn't know about the bad health effects of this hydrogenated trans fat, but they wanted to beat the competition. What was the biggest competitor of Crisco? other cooking fats such as butter and lard. So if AHA tells the general public that Crisco is good and traditional cooking fats are bad, then it will sway many more people to buy Crisco. So thanks to the generous funding from PNG, AHA became a powerful nationwide non-profit organization. Then as I also talked about in my video on Dr. Ansel Keys, in 1961 AHA recommended to the general public that saturated fats such as butter, lard and tallow are bad for health and unsaturated fats such as vegetable oils and Crisco are good for health. Thanks to Dr. Ansel Keys and PNG, the now powerful AHA told the public, throw away your natural cooking fats, and almost overnight, America ditched the natural saturated fats and adopted unsaturated fats, also called PUFA. Now, let's take a quick look at what is saturated fat and what is unsaturated fat. As a rule of thumb, if a fat is solid at room temperature, it's a saturated fat. If it's liquid at room temperature, it's an unsaturated fat. But why are saturated fats solid at room temperature? Fats are made of chains of carbon atoms. These carbon atoms, think of them as cheerful creatures who want to meet and bond with as many other creatures as possible. So this cheerful carbon atom, it has four limbs, so it can bond with a maximum of four other creatures. So it makes a chain like this. That way, there's no space left to accommodate anything else. So all the carbon atoms are saturated. So the fats made from these straight line chains of carbons are called saturated fats. Due to this straight line structure, saturated fats are stable and solid at room temperature. How about unsaturated fats? Unsaturated fats have two categories, MUFA and PUFA. In MUFA, which stands for monounsaturated fatty acids, there's only one place in the carbon chain that's not saturated. Mono means one. Now this double bond brings about a kink in the chain, so a MUFA fat looks like this. It's not as stable, and so it's liquid at room temperature. How about PUFA? So PUFA is polyunsaturated fatty acid. Poly means many. PUFA is a chain of carbons where the chain lacks saturation in more than one place. In a PUFA, the carbon chain is bent in so many places that it's more like a semicircle rather than a straight line. And because of this structure, the molecules don't fit into each other. So they're usually liquid at room temperature. And because saturated fats are more stable, they are better for cooking. They have a naturally higher smoke point, the temperature at which the cooking fat starts to oxidize. That's not good. So higher smoke point means better cooking fat. For example, ghee, a saturated cooking fat, has a natural smoke point of about 250 degrees Celsius, which makes a good cooking fat. So now that we understand the difference between saturated fats and unsaturated fats in our diets, let's get back to our original question. Why don't supermarket vegetable oils smell of vegetables, or for that matter, anything? And to answer that, we have to look at how they manufacture these oils. The manufacturers use a very complex industrial process to extract as much oil as possible from the small seeds. But this oil that's rich in PUFA has a problem. They oxidize very easily. The most common PUFA is called linoleic acid. Remember in my last video on Ansel Keys, I mentioned how he and Dr. Franz basically replaced the saturated fats with linoleic acid, which reduced the cholesterol in the subjects of the Minnesota study, but it didn't stop people from dying of heart disease. More people, in fact, died of heart disease when the natural saturated fats in their diets 
were replaced by linoleic acid. Further studies revealed that seed oils rich in PUFA or linoleic acid are actually about 4000% or 40 times more susceptible to oxidation than MUFA or oleic acid. On every bottle of olive oil, it says you must keep the olive oil away from light and direct sun. Olive oil is 90% MUFA but 10% PUFA. This 10% PUFA can oxidize quickly after getting exposed to sunlight. Think about it for a second. This 10% PUFA oxidation can render the whole bottle of olive oil taste and smell really bad and unsuitable for human consumption. Oxidation turns fats toxic by creating chemicals called aldehydes. In fact, foods fried in so-called vegetable oils contain up to 20,000% of the daily allowed aldehyde limit set by WHO. So, heating seed oil PUFAs oxidizes them quickly. Remember that. Now, let's look at the seed oil manufacturing process. In the processing plant, to extract as much oil as possible from the tiny, tiny seeds, they use a process called solvent extraction, in which they use hexane, which is a volatile hydrocarbon. Occupational hexane poisoning has occurred in different parts of the world from time to time. The most recent one was in Chinese workers manufacturing iPhones suffered hexane poisoning. Unfortunately, hexane is not regulated by FDA, so despite its neurotoxicity, it's still used in a lot of industrial processes such as seed oil extraction. During the acid wash stage, the oil is heated at 80 degrees Celsius. Then, during neutralization process, the oil is further heated to 95 degrees Celsius. Then, during bleaching process, the oil is heated between 90 and 110 degrees Celsius. As a result of acid wash, neutralization and bleaching, the oil gets so rancid it can't be used for cooking. So to hide this rancid smell and taste, the oil is run through a process called deodorization where it's heated to 250 degrees Celsius. That's almost double the heat needed for deep frying food in the kitchen. Think about it for a second. The seed oil has already been heated to high temperatures four times, which means this PUFA rich seed oil has already been oxidized many times even before it reaches your nearest grocery store or supermarket. But as a result of it, the PUFA rich deodorized oil has no smell of any kind at all. And that answers the question that started my quest for this video. Supermarket oils don't smell anything because they have been heated again and again and again to make sure the rancid smell of the factory produced oil goes away. But the final product, if you can call it so, looks very shiny and beautiful in the packaged form. Now it's delivered to the supermarket where it sits under bright lights for quite some time and during all this time on the shelf it further keeps oxidizing. So, how much nutrition is left in the final bottled shiny oil by the time it reaches your kitchen? My guess, not much to talk about. But then, how come you read about them having excellent smoke point? Think about it for a second. After the seed oils have gone through these various processes in which they are heated again and again, they are no more the natural oils that they were when the process started. So, saying that processed cooking oil has a very high smoke point doesn't make much sense. What happens when you consume the food fried in these seed oils? It oxidizes further inside your body and creates aldehydes which are closely related to cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes and even Alzheimer's. So, does that mean we should never consume these unsaturated PUFA fats? No. Not necessarily. Omega-3 and omega-6 fats are unsaturated fats, no doubt, and you need them in your body, no doubt, but you don't need them as energy sources, and you definitely don't need them as cooking fats. Why? Because they are very unstable, and so the moment they come in touch with heat or light, they oxidize. The best way to use MUFA and PUFA fats is to drizzle them over a salad or pizza or bread or sushi. You don't need them as energy sources. We need them as dietary supplements. That means we need them only in very small quantities because if you consume a lot of omega-6 PUFA, it creates a lot of inflammation which leads to diabetes and dementia. So, what are the key takeaways of this video? First, do not use factory-made, refined vegetable oils or seed oils 
as cooking fats. Instead, use naturally occurring saturated fats such as tallow, lard, butter, and coconut oil. Second, use cold press mufa fats such as olive oil in your diet but without heating. Third, use pufa fats such as omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids in small quantities as dietary supplements and at all times keep them away from sunlight or any other source of heat. And most important, try to avoid deep fried food as much as possible because of the very high probability of you ending up with a lot of bad aldehydes in your body. Thank you for watching till the end. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye bye.